The Thermaltake View 71 Snow Edition shows off your build in style with a frosty white paint job and four tempered glass side panels. You also get two pre-installed 140mm ring white LED fans, a vertical GPU mount with bracket, and three-way radiator support for water cooling. So click the sponsor link in the description to learn more. What's up guys, welcome back to Paul's Hardware. This is Probing Paul, episode number 27. Uh, this is my monthly Q&A video, and I didn't do it last month, so technically this is mine for August, although it is September 2nd now, and I just got back from a two-week trip through the European Union, visited Germany, uh, as well as Austria and the Czech Republic. It was pretty cool. I brought back some spoils of, of my travels, like I got some Czech crowns here, and I got some Euro dollars. Uh, which are which are very fun, but even though I just got home and like I haven't even unpacked one of the first things I knew I had to do was get my probing Paul on so thanks to you guys who have submitted questions which were uh, from last month's probing Paul which it goes pretty far back there these days So post a comment on this video if you want me to potentially answer it in next month's probing Paul But let's get right to it with question number one from Johnny T. Chalatsis uh, a eternal question here looks versus performance with a PC. He wants my opinion on that, especially with RGB still going crazy. Not obvious stuff like spend more money on bling, but about details. Uh, so he has a Ryzen 1600 at 3.9 gigahertz, 75 degrees on Ida 64, but he doesn't want to give up his Wraith Spire LED because it's got that RGB ring on it, which is which is a pretty nice little cooler, especially for something that comes relatively stock with like an 1800X. Uh, thank you for your comment, Johnny. And I'm gonna answer this two ways. First, for you specifically, you have a Ryzen 1600 at 3.9 gigahertz, 75 degrees on Ida 64, that's a stress test. So you're not gonna really be using your CPU that much in day-to-day -day performance. I'd be curious to see what types of temperatures you get when you're just gaming, for example, or maybe rendering video or doing transcoding or something like that. I think you're in a pretty good situation, so you're probably just fine sticking with that Ray Spire LED, especially if you like the LED. If you do want to upgrade, there are sort of blingy, colorful options, like maybe a CryoRig uh, H7 Quad Lumi, for example, that you could upgrade to that would give you some better performance while still giving you that RGB goodness. But more to the general question of looks versus performance, because I've dealt with this for a very long time. And if I go back to my old school days when I was first building computers, like in the 90s and 2000s, I would always say, Performance is king. Always go for performance and anything that you're doing to make your PC pretty is basically vanity and you should ignore it and you should take that money and spend it on more performance. And I still generally feel that way, but I feel like building PCs has changed somewhat. It used to be more of a value proposition. Build your own computer and you'll save maybe 300 bucks versus buying a pre-built from Gateway or whoever was building computers back then. Now, you don't save as much money building your own computer, but it does make it a personal thing, and especially for PC gamers who might spend a lot of time on it, building something that you like the looks of, I think does have some value. So don't throw those aesthetics out the window, but still generally gear yourself towards buying stuff that's first and foremost performance oriented, and then maybe add the blingy RGB stuff on later. And even if you're trying to build like an all black or just a single color PC, it still can be challenging and you still might spend a little bit more money than you would otherwise, but making it personal I think is important. So um, take that into consideration. Next question from Goo38. I wanted to know your thoughts on multiple audio jacks featured on most motherboards. Do many speaker spet setups require so many 3.5 inch jacks for multi-channel audio? In most home theater setups, wouldn't an HDMI out make more sense if you're using an AV receiver, uh, higher quality, more features such as Dolby and DTS uh, streaming compatibility? And uh, I referenced there comparing the smartphone industry which recently removed the 3.5 inch jack. So uh, I'm gonna use my little mini portable benchmarking PC that I took on my trip but I did not actually use Actually, thankfully, it would have been a little challenging to do that on the road. Uh, but audio jacks, right here at the back. They're multicolored, so you got the inputs. Your uh, pink is the mic input. Blue is a line in, which I've never used for anything before. Green is your standard left and right out. Uh, the orange is subwoofer and center channel, and then the black and sometimes gray will be uh, your side and your rear channels. Now, the reason I think so many motherboards still have these is legacy support. And if you talk to motherboard manufacturers, it's always something that they're concerned about, is making a new motherboard that lets Let's go with some older features that pisses people off because they have some epic 7.1 channel surround sound system that they really wanted to use those analog outputs for. But more to the fundamentals here, what you're talking about is the difference between analog and digital and where that conversion from a digital audio signal to an analog signal that then gets put out over your speakers takes place. 
If you're plugging into the motherboard's analog outputs here, then you're using the motherboard's sound hardware in order to do that DAC work, digital to analog conversion. But as you mentioned, in most cases, it's actually much more sensible to do a digital output. So you can get a digital 5.1 or 7.1 output via your HDMI. You can also use uh, the Toslink here, a little uh, SPDIF connection, and that will also give you digital and you can connect that up to a home theater. So most people, I think now, are not using those analog outputs unless you're just using the standard green jack for left and right if you're just plugging in headphones or something like that. So it does seem like something that we might see go the way of the ISA slot in the future, but I wouldn't expect it anytime soon. I don't think it's necessarily a premium in space savings right there in the motherboard IO. There's generally a decent amount of room there still. And for motherboard manufacturers that put a lot of effort into the sound circuitry, like uh, Asus calls their Supreme effects and there's different variants of that, if you're not using those analog outputs, then you're not using that componentry that's built into the motherboard, so that kind of gets wasted. Next question from Clarion Hatake. Hey Paul, I only have a 500 gig SSD. I want to expand my storage though. Uh, I do video editing, gaming, mostly gaming, and I don't know what I should buy, an SSD or a hard drive. Uh, SSDs are getting really pricey here. Hard drive is really cheap. One terabyte could be useful. SSDs actually have been coming down in price. So I'm just taking a quick look at PC Part Picker here, and I'm sorting uh, SSDs by price per gigabyte, 13 or 14 cents price per gigabyte, and look at the capacities that you're getting the best deals on right now. It's actually the 500 gig range SSDs, even the one and terabyte ones. You gotta go down here to this inland 240 gig to get a 16 cent per gig, $40, 240 gig SSD, which is still a good price. I'm, I'm not sure about this particular model, but the point is you can get larger capacity SSDs for cheaper these days and 500 gig SSDs you should be able to get for around 70 to $90. Now, of course, if we compare that to standard hard drives, we're looking at two cents per gig, two to three cents per gig. If you're looking down here at the these three and four terabyte models, uh, again, it depends on the capacity, price per gig to give you your total price, but a uh, three terabyte drive for $60, or a four terabyte drive for $85. Some pretty good deals there on capacity. So my recommendation to you would be to get both, but that's actually more because of your use case. You talk about video editing. If you're editing video, it really makes sense to have multiple drives. The best case scenario is to have a single drive, preferably an SSD for your operating system and your software, another drive to have your raw video on that you're editing, and then even better to have a third drive, also probably hopefully an SSD for a cache drive, um, but that's getting a little bit more advanced. But the mass raw storage is also something that you'll want, especially if you're editing video, you're gonna fill up your SSDs pretty fast. So I would recommend look into another 500 gig SSD first because that's where your performance will come from, but to follow it up pretty quickly with a mass storage drive, again, you can get a two or three terabyte hard drive for very inexpensive these days. Uh, so it's nice that storage prices have continued to fall and I hope that helps you. Next question here from Prathamish Pasconti, and uh, this is a similar question, at least still storage related. How do I know if the M.2 slot in a laptop can accommodate M.2 SATA SSDs as well? And he means as well as NVMe SSDs, I am guessing. So here's an example. I have two SSDs, both with M.2 connectors. M.2 physically is the physical connector, so you got the connector on the SSD side, and then you have the slot in the motherboard itself. But there are two standards, two interface standards, that these can also com be compatible with. So you might have a SATA M.2 SSD, or you might have an NVMe M.2 SSD. NVMe is newer and faster and better, but sometimes you can get less expensive SATA SSDs, which are still perfectly fast and adequate and decent enough. Basically, it's the same amount of bandwidth you would get uh, if you're connecting to a SATA Rev3 connection, like a standard SATA plug. Now, the short answer here is you need to ask your laptop manufacturer by either referencing the manual or going to their website and finding specifically if your laptop can open up and has slots in there for M.2 drives that you can expand with. It should be clearly listed whether it is NVMe compatible or SATA compatible or both, and sometimes if it's both, it might auto-detect, or you might need to go into your laptop's BIOS to switch it and tell it, I want NVMe mode, or I want SATA mode. Next question here from Kevin Vaghi. Uh, hey Paul, in many of your budget-oriented PC builds, uh, you and other tech user YouTubers, there always seems to be a recommendation of a SATA 3 SSD and a SATA 3 hard drive, each usually costing 50 to 60 bucks based on US pricing. At that cost, why do you not recommend 
a pair of RAID 0 hard drives for optimal, comfortable load times, both the operating system and games. He's talking about hard drives, but I'm gonna switch this and, and then pretend you're asking about RAID 0 a couple of SSDs. The main reason I don't recommend hard drives at all for operating system drives is response time. Uh, SSDs are much, much faster with response time, and that is the primary thing that makes it feel so much faster when you're loading into your operating system or loading up a program uh, that, that's the SSD boost that you get. Now, back to your question, why wouldn't you then recommend maybe two SSDs that were less expensive and you can RAID a couple SSDs together in RAID 0 and then you would get better performance out of them and you would combine the capacity of both. The reason there is complexity as well as uh, fail-safe and I don't like to recommend a solution to people that has the potential for disaster. One of the ways we like to describe RAID 0 is that you have zero fallbacks if you actually have a drive fail. So two points of failure and if either of those dies your data is gone. There's also a little bit more complexity to setting up RAID 0. Uh, you gotta usually go into the motherboard's BIOS to turn on RAID mode and then you gotta create the RAID ar array and then sometimes when you're loading uh, Windows you need to get an extra driver in there so that Windows can recognize the RAID array in order to load onto it. It's not that complex but it's usually another step or two that a first time user wouldn't be as familiar with. So for that reason I usually recommend a simpler solution of a single SSD for your operating system and frequently used programs and then a long-term mass storage hard drive uh, that you can have your backups on. Actually two hard drives in RAID 1 would be what I really want for your long-term storage. That way you can have a little bit of redundancy built in there. That way if you have all your, your irreplaceable pictures, personal files, and one of the drives fails you still have a backup solution. But um, perhaps I'll do a more advanced like storage, simple storage solutions video in the future. That'd be a reasonable idea. Thank you for your question though Kevin. Next up is WD40 uh, with an interesting question here. Why doesn't somebody make a graphics card that literally plugs into two PCI Express slots? I mean, as long as you have a motherboard that supports uh, 16 lanes by two, uh, that would give a lot more headroom and more bandwidth to deliver more power. Uh, and it must, although it must be a pain in the ass to keep PCIe lanes synchronized, uh, it would also uh, allow a massive cooler to have plenty of support uh, to combat GPU sag. Now, the first part of your question, I think, is somewhat answered by the existence of two-way SLI configurations, like with NVIDIA, and they just use an SLI bridge to connect those two cards together. There is also not really an issue of bandwidth when it comes to a by 16 PCI Express Gen 3 slot. You have, some, I think, 32 gigabytes per second bi-directional there. So a single graphics card, even your highest end, like GTX 1080 Ti, is not gonna be able to saturate that. NVIDIA, for example, only requires a by eight connection uh, in order to support SLI configurations. But the second part of your question, I think is kind of interesting. The idea that GPU sag is a problem in a lot of situations, and there are triple slot cooler designs, would it be possible to make an extension or an add-on to the cooler or something that just slots into that third PCI Express slot to provide more support, a dummy slot that doesn't actually make connection with any of the gold contact points? I could maybe see that happening. It would hurt potentially the compatibility of the card, but what if there was a cooler that had like a bracket you could snap onto it and then that would slot into th the third one so you could remove it if you didn't necessarily have that slot right there where it was supposed to be? That's a very interesting idea, I think. And I'd be curious to know if any of my GPU manufacturer friends have already potentially thought of that or at least considered it because they have lots of ideas that don't all necessarily come to fruition. So uh, maybe I'll ask about that and hopefully follow up in a future video. Just a couple more quick questions here from Stop Pre-Ordering Video Games. Uh, it's, it's a very good name. Uh, does anyone know which mouse wrist rest Paul uses? The gray one in my capture PC. That's, that's this one right here. Uh, this is made by Handstands and I found it just on Amazon and I will link this in the description. I actually tend to link this in the description of most of my Q&A videos just as a random link that goes in there because this question actually gets asked quite a bit. This one does have some nori fur on it um, but I like it because it's got the micro beads in it and I wanted one that's not attached to a mouse pad because I have lots of different mouse pads and I tend to move it around a lot from PC to PC. But one of the tricks with this that I read about in the description is if it's a little too full for you, if you want it to be a little bit flatter, you can sort of undo the threading here a little bit and squeeze out some of the micro beads and uh, make it a little flatter for you. But I like to use a wrist rest because ergonomically speaking, if you're using a mouse, you should try to keep the plane of your wrist as flat as possible and uh, I just, I'm in the habit of using wrist rests and I like this one. And the last question from Patrick Stewart. Oh, I'm honored, sir. How many probes can Paul take before it's too much? It's a good question. Probably as eternal a question as the first question in this video about looks versus performance. 
Um, but I think many more, many more, many more probings are still to come. So guys, thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you maybe have learned a few things or maybe just enjoyed hanging out with me. Uh, if you know the conversion rate for Czech Karuna, uh, then let me know how much this is actually worth. This is, this is 70. I have 70 Czech crowns right here, ready to, ready to spend next time I'm in the Czech Republic. Prague was beautiful. But guys, leave questions in the comment section down below if you want me to answer them in next month's probing poll, which will probably just be in a few months since it's already September. Thank you so much for watching this video once again, and we'll see you next time.